Okay, now we've got this going. Good evening, everyone. My name is Megan Arsman, and I'm excited to host tonight's special webinar for the Indiana Thoroughbred Alliance. For those who may not be familiar with the Alliance, I just want to kind of um, share a brief summary about this wonderful group. The ITA is a collaboration of breeders, owners, trainers, and horse racing enthusiasts dedicated to the continued success of thoroughbred breeding and racing in the state of Indiana. The ITA has members from stallion owners, farm owners, broodmare managers, trainers, owners, breeders, and just plain horse racing fans. The group was incorporated in October 2020 and has already been focusing their efforts on the education and promotion on education for the breeders and promotion of racehorse aftercare. This is actually the third educational event for the ITA in such a short period of time. The first being a pedigree analysis seminar, which was held with Crestwood Farms, Robert Keck in December. Then the second was a broodmare nutrition webinar with Kentucky Equine Nutrition that was held in January. The ITA will also be hosting a webinar on April 29th with the Kentucky Equine Nutrition on feeding the growing racehorse. So stay posted for more information in the coming days. We'll get that all that up there on our Facebook page and on our website as well. With the coming racing season set to kick off at Indiana Grand later this month, I'm excited to discuss the opportunities for owning a racehorse in the state of Indiana and beyond. While the general public might be led to believe that you must be rich to own a racehorse, that is certainly not the case here in Indiana or anywhere for that matter. Group ownership gives horse racing enthusiasts that heart pounding thrill and the ultimate experience of being in the winner's circle without a lot of the headache and financial strain of the traditional sole ownership. Being part of a managed ownership group allows you to invest some money while enjoying the tax benefits and being able to say that you own a racehorse. Now I do wanna say that different groups work in different ways. So it's always advised to do your own research when it comes to choosing a managed ownership group. Indiana Grand has seen many groups racing at the Shelbyville track and I'm proud to introduce three of those groups and their managing partners to you tonight. These three gentlemen will share their experiences and a little about their individual groups with everyone. And then we'll discuss the ins and outs of group ownership and answer any questions you might have. Now you might notice we actually only have two gentlemen. That is because Nate Brannon of BNB Stables had a little accident this afternoon and had thrown out his back. So he's moving a little gingerly and taking his time getting online. So hopefully we'll have him joining us here soon, but I'll introduce him real quick. Nate, um, I believe Nate started out as a member of Indiana Grand's own racehorse ownership club, Grand Gesture, a few years ago, owning a portion of a horse trained by Anthony Granitz. Nate actually attended the fractional ownership seminar that the Indiana Horse Racing Commission hosted in 2000 and I believe 18 Harlan and met with Harlan Malter, whom I'll introduce you to a little later and was inspired to start his own group. Next on the panel, we have Michael Lauer, who happens to be the all-time leading breeder in the state of Indiana, as well as one of the all-time leading trainers at Indiana Grand. He and his wife, Penny, have bred racehorses for more than 30 years and are staunch supporters of the Indiana Thoroughbred Breed Development Program. They race mostly their own horses that are they bred, racing at Churchill Downs, Indiana Grand, Turfway Park, Oak Lawn Park, Saratoga, and Keeneland. You name it. In fact, just last night, one of Mike's Indiana breds, Strong Tide, won an allowance at Oak Lawn. So that'll be a nice little breeders award coming to them to start the Indiana race meet. And finally, last but certainly not least, we have Harlan Malter. Harlan is the managing partner of Iron Horse Racing Stables named after his favorite baseball player, Lou Gehrig. While Harlan is mostly based in Southern California, he fell in love with horse racing growing up in New York and has become a very big supporter of the Indiana program. Iron Horse Racing owns Indiana's all-time money-earning leader, Bucero, who retired sound, just barely missing the $1 million mark in 2018. 
Bucaro became the first Indiana bred to race at the Breeders' Cup World Championships twice, both times having a great showing in the grade one turf sprint, and also the first Indiana bred to be invited to race and compete successfully at Royal Ascot. Not to mention Harlan is probably the first and only person to ever get Indiana trainer Tim Gleishaw to wear a top hat and tails and act like a gentleman for at least a couple hours. So there you have it. I mean, that for anybody that knows Tim Gleishaw, that's, a, that's successful right there. So, oh, and we have Nate is just now joining us. And, and also, thank you so much, Nate. He's getting himself situated. Again, if you guys have any questions during our seminar, please go ahead and type it in the chat box and we will get going. Nate, thank you so much for joining us. Still can't hear you. So what we'll go ahead and do is I want each gentleman to go ahead and introduce themselves first. I know I gave you guys a little bit of background on them, but let's start off. Mike, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and your history in horse racing? Well, uh, it's been pretty much a lifelong uh, job. Uh, my parents, my father in particular, always had a horse or two in Ohio, read a horse or two, and then they would race them. Um, and that worked out quite fine for, for, quite good for him. And then I just started migrating to it. I left him at the college and came back and ended up right back on the racetrack. Uh, so I, I guess that's where I wanted to be. And I've been there pretty much ever since, which is 40 some years. Um, we, as, as, as Megan said, we, we, we uh, train mostly in the Midwest. We do go East occasionally, <clears throat> if the horse takes us there. We've um, breed most of our own horses, mainly because we couldn't afford to buy them. So we have a little farm and then we started breeding and uh, it's worked out good for us. And we've um, have formed some partnerships where we've let people in for usually a minimum of 5% uh, just for bookkeeping purposes, even though there's some groups within the group that um, have their own little uh, partnership. And they've had the thrill of racing, the, the ups and downs and um, the whole thrill of it. Um, it's worked very good for them and, and very good for us. And we've had some very successful horses like Mr. Pollard who's won 600,000 for a group. And there was um, um, the Money Dance won 300 mm -hmm. and some thousand. He was horse of, the year, horse of the year in Indiana one year. And um, Obsolete, which is still running, a Phillies up close to 300,000. So it's worked out good. And we've had some, you know, bad horses as everybody else. We just try to move them on. Right, definitely. Yes. Well, thank you, Mike. Nate, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of introduce yourself to our, to our attendees tonight. <clears throat> okay, uh, my name's Nate Brannon. I'm the managing partner of B&B Stables. Uh, my friend uh, uh, Chad Berkmeyer and I uh, started B&B Stables back in 2017. Um, opening day at the meet that year, we met Tiana Richardville and talked with her about uh, having an interest in uh, becoming owners and learning about the industry. And she referred us to uh, Anthony Granitz and uh, the Grand Gesture stable that was going on. And uh, so we got involved with that. And then it was probably six or eight weeks uh, of doing that. We approached Anthony and told him we were interested in uh, becoming a larger partner and possibly starting our own little group. And uh, he went over some things about options about going forward, whether it was a yearling, a two-year-old, or a claiming horse, or being part of one he had. And we decided to uh, go the yearling route and take a big swing at it. And then uh, I, I uh, attended a seminar 
uh, at the Indiana Grand that Harlan spoke at and uh, really got motivated after hearing him and being involved in that. And uh, we started uh, 2018 with the two-year-old and she didn't race, but towards the end of the year, uh, we had some interest and we got a couple teams together and talked to Tony and he had a couple spots available and we purchased uh, part of two horses with him with our fractional group and actually was fortunate enough to win our very first race uh, under the B&B name and had our silks on and it, it, it was a great time and it, it just kind of snowballed from there we end, end up having four horses after that and then uh our good horse got claimed and one retired and one was no good and <laughs> we got pretty low and then fortunately uh anthony let, let us in on another uh, two-year-old last year and then we became uh, friends with tc racing and jim doby out of tell city uh, we were partners with him on Sunday drive and uh, we talked to him about breeding and he had a mare available. So we partnered with him and had our first foal this year, uh, Indiana sired. And that was a lot of fun. I, I was over the moon excited when we finally had a live foal on the ground. And uh, he also had an unraced three-year-old and uh, asked us if we wanted in on that and he gave us an offer that uh, we couldn't turn down and and we took that horse to tiana back where we originally started in 2017 with that just a little conversation we had with her and now we have one with her and one with tony for this year and um, we have our uh, foal and actually got uh, our best horse royal jim we got her back um, about two or three weeks ago from Cipriano. So looking forward to having her as a brood mare. Now you said that you had your first Indiana sired foal. Who is the Indiana stallion? Uh, it's a Nawi. Okay. And are yeah. you, do you already have plans to breed back? Uh, we're not going to breed back that mare, but uh, we have... Royal Jim at Breakaway, she's going to uh, breed the calculator. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. So we'll have a, hopefully have another full next year. <laughs> That's always the fun part. The, the, any of our breeders can tell you guys that being a breeder is a very heart wrenching, but very heart warming experience. So congratulations to BMB and yeah. your guys' first successful full. That's very exciting. Yeah, and now you get to watch as, as the full progresses through the next couple of years. Yeah. Awesome. And then of course we have Mr. Malter out in South, Southern California. Go ahead and regale us with some background on you. Well, it's, uh, I'm glad to be here, Megan. You've always, uh, You've been there from the very start with our kind of Indiana. Megan did a fantastic job at the Racing Commission and is doing a great job here with the Alliance. Um, it's fun to be on this panel only because, uh, you know, uh, Mike and Nate kind of both fit into different parts of uh, things I've done in Indiana. Uh, Mike first, when when Bucaro did run into too much coffee the first time, I kind of said, well, we have no chance against Mr. Pollard. And uh, I still remember the call. Here, here comes Mr. Pollard coming at Bucaro and... Uh, Mike did such a great job with that horse. Uh, we were, you know, over the moon, like we we you know, won the Breeders' Cup beating him that day because uh, he was such a nice horse. But, uh, and Nate, again, I remember you at the uh, at, at the seminar and it's it's great to see people kind of following through with this. My story very quickly is a little bit different than Mike's. My, my father, other than taking me to a ton of sports, uh, you know, sporting events, he was not a horse guy. I don't think he would He's been within 100 feet of a horse in his life. Uh, he's not an animal guy. He came from the city. But I used to go up to Saratoga, and I fell in love with uh, with horse racing, 77, 78, uh, Seattle Slough, Affirmed Alidar. Um, and that was always a passion of mine. And, and kind of how I got to the partnership business was, and again, 
Nate, it's great that you had that access as far as kind of people really advocating for partnerships. And Mike, it was just natural for you. But I was in uh, New Jersey at the time. And I said, oh, you know, I wouldn't mind owning a horse. Uh, but you go to Philadelphia Park, you go to any racetrack, there's not a welcome wagon at the door. Um, you don't know who to talk to. You, you, you don't even know where to start. Um, and what I did was I found a little tiny ad and I think the DRF and gave $500 to own part of a horse. And that guy within about seven months stole all the money. And that was my first experience of horse racing. Now, the good news was that I got on the backside and I met a trainer and I kind of started to understand how it all worked. So for the, about the first six or seven years, uh, we were doing small partnership groups with people I knew. Um, and then uh, somebody called me and said, I have an Indiana bred. I'd never been to Indiana. I have an Indiana bred by a first year stallion um, out of a, just a regular mare. Uh, but boy, do I love this horse and uh, he's gonna be something special. Suddenly I knew everything about Indiana. I knew every stakes race, how unbelievable the breeding program was. And uh, when I called Mike Trombetta in, in, in Maryland and said, listen, I'm giving you this horse, it's June. There's a two-year-old stakes race in three months. I'd like to run in it. And he said to me, Indiana has stakes races? So from that comment to kind of leading Bucara all the way to the end, uh, you know, I've just been a huge fan of Indiana racing. Uh, and the partnership concept. So basically as Bucero wound down his career, I decided that I was going to do a much more national uh, partnership group um, to kind of give people the access to horses in a broad range from a lower priced horse to a, a, a pretty expensive horse. Um, so we put the partnership together, uh, group together. We have about 18 horses right now. Uh, we were lucky enough to make it back to the Breeders' Cup last year with a two-year-old we bought last March. Uh, who ran in the uh, juvenile turf sprint named Momos, which was a lot of fun. He won first out at Saratoga. And um, what I try to tell people is it, it, kind of what Megan said. Um, I'll, I'll kind of really quickly hit on really what everybody has said here. Um, you don't need to be rich to own horses, but you definitely need to be committed um, because it's not an easy game. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people... Um, you know, tell the story. Well, you're going to get the big one. You know, just keep doing it. You're going to get the big one. And, you know, you kind of feel bad saying that because there are a lot of people who go their whole life without getting the big one. And, you know, we were lucky enough to get it. He was a $43,000 two-year-old um, and obviously took us all over the world, um, you know, to run in all the biggest races. So what I like about the partnerships is you're able to access um, courses that, you know, you wouldn't be able to access on your own. It's, it's quite expensive, obviously, to keep a horse for a whole year. Uh, we can kind of get, we'll get into the details of kind of how, how that all works. But the partnership format, especially um, the way it's going now with both um, communication and social media, um, it's really enhanced the product quite a bit. Uh, our partners are very active in speaking to us and communicating with me and the communication I get with the trainers and the video and, and, and photos. Uh, really allow somebody who owns 5% of a horse um, to, to just get that full experience. So um, it's been a great journey for us and uh, it's fun to be here on this panel with everybody. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's the thing. And a lot of, a lot of race tracks now have ownership clubs. Indiana Grand had one for a few years, had Grand Gesture, um, they've kind of been a little defunct. I know Hoosier Park has one, our harness racing track in Anderson. They still have a first turn stable, so that's fun. Um, but it's those are a lot of times a great way to get introduced to it, as Nate can attest to that. And then it, it is hard for people that are interested in owning horses, owning race horses, or being in the game to figure out where to go. And I think that's part of the ITA's mission is to help with that and to make sure that um you know there's a more resources available so if you ever want to we have the ita's website is indianatb.org and we actually did just launch a group ownership page under the about section and you'll see the current ownership groups that are racing in Indiana, which includes Iron Horse, Michael Lauer Racing Stables, B&B &B Stables, and West Thoroughbreds. 
So we're getting that going and trying to help alleviate a little bit of that confusion. And there's also uh, the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association, TOBA, that has a great program called Owner View. And you can go on to Owner View and learn everything you need to know about owning a racehorse and kind of have some resources there. So just to kind of kick things off, that's how, that's some ideas of where you can go. Um, I think one of the first things that's really important for people to think about when it comes to doing a fractional ownership group or managed ownership group or a partnership or syndication, however you want to call it, each one is a little different in their own way, but they are basically the same thing. The goal is to own a racehorse and to be part of the industry. And one of the important things I think that people need to ask themselves is what are your expectations? You got to think about financially, socially, um, experiential. Mm -hmm. If you are worried about, you know, how much money this is going to take, this is something you need to think about um, and all. And, you know, the, the old joke is how do you make a million dollars in horse racing or in the horse industry? You start off with two million. So, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, you're not going to be making a lot of money, but you just want to experience being an owner. And this is what ownership, ownership groups are all about. So for you guys, and I'll let you guys decide who wants to speak first, but what do you usually feel is important for somebody to realize when to think about when it comes to what their expectations should be. What should some, what should they have in the back of their mind when they're looking at getting into an ownership group? I guess I'll, I'll start. If you want to go, Nate? Yeah, go ahead, Arlen. Okay. Well, I mean, basically what I was going to say is I, th I think that when you, one of the most important things, and, and we're starting to get a big, broad, uh, uh, options as far as uh, there's the, the new MyRacehorses.com where you can buy a very, very small share of a, of a horse and others where you have a much more, um, um, uh, you know, a larger uh, ownership role. Um, I really think the structure of how the partnership is set up is very, very important. Uh, what you're going to be paying, how you're going to be paying it, how transparent, uh, you know, all the costs are. Uh, different partnerships have different um ways of passing on to the partners, you know, where the money's going, how it's going, uh, how they're getting paid. And, you know, most importantly, uh, I, I really try to talk to people that it, it's equivalent to, if you're a sports fan, you know, buying season tickets to a sporting event, uh, to a team. Um, you know, you really have to look at, we, we just had a horse uh, uh, that got claimed from us and, um, you know, he was okay. I mean, he was a, he was a game horse. He, he performed uh, quite well. He just couldn't get to the winner's circle that often and he ended up getting claimed from us and and most of the partners said look you know what i put in here is about what it would have cost for a one week nice vacation you know I, I had you know 15 or 16 or 17 races that i got to wake up and be excited for um i think that really the most important thing is you have to have a passion for it i always try to tell people about any of these partnerships it's great because and you know mike lives this day in day out so this doesn't apply to him but nate i'm sure knows this you know with with horse racing that first time that horse sits behind the gate and you're waiting for your horse to get in and load, if you don't have that feeling in your, in your chest, it's one way. You're either going to never not own a horse or you're going to go, eh, it's not my thing. And, you know, I think, I think once you realize, you know, kind of what part of your life it is, the finances become uh, more appropriate. If it's something that you're not that excited about, it feels like a really expensive sport. Um, if it's something you're super excited about, you're going to figure out a way to spend the money, just like you would have season tickets to the Colts or, 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 or something like that. So I really tell people to really look into what, what they want to get from that experience. Um, look at the different partnerships of what they're going to offer, the kind of accessibility they'll have to the horses, what the costs involved is a very, very broad range on, on how partnerships are run. Some are very, very expensive. Um, some are uh, a little bit more uh, reasonable as far as the expenses they charge and but most importantly go into it knowing that if it's you know it's going to feel expensive if you don't really love it and if you love it it, it you're going to figure out a way to enjoy it 
No, that's right. Uh, it's the it's the thrill of victory for for a lot of people if they win a race. Uh, they're as happy as if they own ninety five or one hundred percent of it. And uh, I remember when one of our horses won a stake, they ordered six trophies be, be between the group, thrilled to death. Yep. And uh, that's one thing racing doesn't show enough of is the thrill of racing, the going to the winter circle, and uh, having a great time, having a beer afterwards or whatever. And, uh, and and everybody, when they win a race, it's great. When they lose, there's some anxiety sometimes. And, uh, but but that's all part of the game. Yeah. I uh, Anybody that's contacted me um, about joining our group, my, my very first question is, are you looking to have fun or are you looking to make money? Because if you're looking to make money, you need to find something else to do with, but if you want to have fun, you know, they can get in with us. We, we have a lot of fun. We've already been to the track this year. Um, just watching the, the breezes and, and the training and, and we'll go to breakfast afterwards and chit chat and, and have a good time. But um, I make sure that everybody knows that um, it's, it, it's high risk but it is a great source of entertainment. If you're looking for entertainment and want to have a good time, then, then get involved and upfront exactly, not exactly, but to the best you can do, tell them exactly what it's going to cost per month per, for however much percentage they own. And uh, last year was a little tough because um, everybody wanted to, everybody wants to go to do that barn visit and that barn mm -hmm. tour, and, you know, we, we couldn't do it last year and, Hopefully we get back to this year where we can make barn visits. Everybody wants to bring carrots or peppermints or get their picture taken. And um, yeah, uh, our group got their first win. You know, everybody was hooked. Everybody was so excited. It's you know, I'm sure it's great every time, but it's it's never like it was the the first time. You're just in awe. But um, it's it's always fun to win. It's always fun to uh, place or show, but it's you know, it's all about the experience the group has together. And uh, we, we, we really focus on that. You know, we, we want to do our best and go from there. Yeah. Exactly. And I think one of the fun things is being out at the track and seeing the different ownership groups, you know, it's kind of like a team you know right now in indianapolis is hosting the final four we posted the entire ncaa uh tournament and i like in when the track like i know when if ever i'm out there and a bnb &B horse is racing everybody's got their black and yellow on you guys you guys are always out there you know showing showing prides the same with iron horse and and all you know everybody's gonna have that gear you you want to be a part of a team you want to be part of the group and so that's always kind of fun too and all um so nate kind of touched on on it but we'll go ahead and get to the crux of it because everybody wants to know about the money and everybody wants to know about how much that it's going to cost them and there are different groups. Um, Harlan kind of hinted at my racehorse, which got a lot of press with the with Authentic winning the Kentucky Derby this past September. Sounds really weird to say. Um, and then the Breeders' Cup Classic. So, um, you know, my racehorse. They are a group that you could only you would only have to spend maybe fifty dollars, and you would own an inch of a tail. A piece of tail, you know, of the horse, um, you know, but you can still say you want, you, you own a Kentucky Derby winner. Um, but of course, you know, with these groups, we're talking about a little bit more, a, a little bit bigger percentage, um, paying a little bit more than just $50, but not a whole lot. Some of the things that it's really important for people to understand when it comes to ownership groups is, for some, like if you are part of a racehorse, uh, a racetrack club, say um, Canterbury Park up in Minnesota has a club, um, Churchill Downs has one, and of course each one works differently, but most of the times with those, you pay one fee and that's it. 
$250 or something, you know, around that number to watch the horse race the rest of the year and that, that track. So you usually have, you know, you have the upfront costs, whether it's to help purchase a horse at the sale, uh, you have your maintenance fees, you have monthly fees, training fees, and it all depends and it all differs with the, with the groups. And you guys all manage your finances differently and it's okay. There's no right or wrong way of handling the payments for a group. So I think it's important that we go around and talk about how, just give a general uh, description of the different costs for you guys. And I know it also depends on whether you're gonna claim a horse, if you're buying a horse outright, um, if you're buying, you know, a two-year-old from the sale, um, you know, or, and also there, there's a lot of variables, but let's talk about if you were getting a horse to race starting mid-April at Indiana Grand and somebody wanted to come to you and say, I want to be part of your group, what would you tell them? Let's start, we, we'll start with Mike. Mike, what would you tell them for finances? What are the different things that to be part of Team Green Michael Lauer Racing, um, do you guys, it, what are the different fees and how do you set that up financially? Well, you have a daily training fee and then you have um, your veterinary fee, which will vary, vary with each horse on each month. And um, it's gonna run somewhere between 25 and 3,000 a month per horse uh, when, when they're in training. And that's split up with what percent you own. I always tell people it's cheaper than, than, than playing golf every week if you own 5%. And it's and more fun in my opinion, but everybody has that. Um, so, uh, and, we, and we build them monthly. Um, and, when the, and when we win races or purses, we, uh, we distribute the money monthly. Um, we don't hold the money at the end of the year or anything like that. So, um, we, as I said, we uh, we have monthly bills, and, and they have. Uh, and if we win money, we get the money monthly, and we move on to the next month. Do you guys have upfront costs? Do you have an initial initial fee for that horse, or is it just all started with the monthlies? No, we have initial costs. We go by the pedigree or um, what what who the horse is by colt filly or what it looks like you know some might have similar pedigrees but one looks better than the other one so we will um the cost will be might will vary um okay. and that starts anywhere from like fifteen thousand to, to 35 to forty thousand per individual that's that's the gross per, that's the gross cost okay not that that's not what you have to pay totally up front no Okay, <laughs> just want to make sure we explain that to everybody. No if you just want to buy in, you buy in, and then we go from there. Okay, Nate, how about you? How does your how does B and B Stables work when it comes to um, the finances to get started? Um, we do a zero percent markup, so you know whatever we pay, that that's what our partners pay. Uh, we used to do month to month, and um, what I like to tell our partners is, uh, if you want, if it's ten percent, it's going to be, I say, on average about three hundred dollars per month if you own ten percent. If you own five uh, percent, it's just going to be uh, around one fifty. Just depends on the vet bills and 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 stuff like that. But um, the, uh, we don't mark up anything. So, you know, just whatever horse we buy, whatever the cost was and whatever your, your percentage you want, then that's what you pay. And then the, the, the monthly bill, like our group now, I told them uh, it's probably going to be about uh, for each person that we've got now, it's going to be about $150 a month just to be safe. But what we did on this uh, recent horse is we did six months. So you pay six months and then, you know, checks and balances wherever you're at after six months. If the horse has earned money, you're gonna have, you know, we can extend on 
And then at the end of the, uh, when the, when the, the horse is retired or claimed, whatever money is left in the account is divided equally. Okay. And then Harlan, how about you? So uh, very similar. Um, we buy almost all of our horses at auction. Um, so we're either buying yearlings or two-year-olds and sometimes even weanlings. So basically everybody will pay similar to Nate. Uh, I didn't steal your idea, Nate, because I was before you, but we're pro, <laughs> that's why we're similar. Uh, so we, we don't mark up anything either. Uh, that is a little bit of a trend in the business uh, for a lot of the, the larger groups is to charge a, sometimes a, a relatively substantial markup uh, on purchase prices. Um, we don't do that. We just, if the horse sells, we're going to be in April, we're going to be buying three or four horses at the April sale. Um, whatever we pay, our partners pay. Um, we do similar to Nate also. We collect, we collect three months uh, of expenses we, we, we run on multiple circuits. Um, so running in New York or Florida uh, with some of the trainers that we use there, uh, we use Bill Mott, Christoph Kaman, um, we use Tim in the Midwest. Uh, we have some horse in, uh, horse in California right now. It, it can range from 3,500 to 4,500 a month. It can get quite expensive. And some of the others, some of our horses are down at Pace and Park, uh, which is a an elite training center down in, in Florida, which has a, its own stall rent. So the one nice thing is, is that whatever our partners pay, it's the exact cost. If they owned hundred percent of the horse, that's exactly what they pay. So as I say to people, it is what it is. Uh, you know, we try to, we try to monitor expenses. Obviously vet bills can be variable. Shipping can be variable, um, things of that sort, but whatever it is they pay. So let's just say on average 3,500 to 4,500, depending on the location uh, and the type of horse, um, and what we do is we use a, a website called horsebills.com, uh, which anybody can check out kind of how it works, but it's really great for our partners because everything, uh, is right there. So at the end of every single month, they get an actual, uh, log into their portal. They can go on whenever they want, but they get an actual bill that breaks down, uh, every bill that was paid that month, their share of it, uh, the deduction that was made off the, uh, the three months of expenses. And we do similar to what Nate does. You know, obviously, if our money comes in, we, we credit it and we continue the expenses. If they run out of money, we do a cash call. We try to keep three months. Um, and then we, uh, we distribute, obviously, if we, if we get a larger sum of money, that's, that makes sense to distribute the money. But again, uh, the easiest thing is, is that with no markup, um, it is what it is is the cost. It's really, like I say, you know, it, it's, it's just as if you owned 100% of the horse, but you're paying your 5% or your 10%. Um, and you know, that's how we do it. We try to keep it as simple as possible. And I think one of the things that some people may not realize, um, especially right now, it is tax season. People are doing their taxes. There is a little bit of an advantage to being part of a ownership group. Um, can either of you guys kind of explain a little bit of what advantages there are when it comes to your taxes and um, any of that um, information about write-offs? Well, uh, the NTRA, the National Thoroughbred Racing Association, has a has a sheet they put out about taxes. But it, um, you know, the, the cost is depreciated over uh, time, and then uh, the cost of the initial uh, of the horse can be depreciated depending on its age, and um, it, depending on its age and how long you keep the horse. Great. We'll, I'll look for that and we can post that on our Facebook page. Um, does anybody else have any other um, comments about the about taxes, Harlan? Yeah, well, as, as Mike was saying, the, there is, um, the good news is, is, is horse ownership is a small segment and they have enough power in Washington to uh, it, it seemingly continue to have some very beneficial tax, uh, tax breaks for horse ownership. Um, uh, from then the partnership level, kind of how the partnership set up is can also affect your taxes. And it's obviously something you talk to your accountant about, but with us, we set up all of our partnerships as LLCs. Um, so all of our partners get a K1 at the end of the year, which passes through any sort of loss that they accrued, um, during the year, uh, which in, in theory, if, if, you know, if somebody has a K1, they can offset K1 income, you know, within their own personal return. So a lot does also depend on how each partnership is structured um, and that's flowing through to each person. 
but there can be internally within each horse, as Mike said, um, there is aggressive depreciation uh, initially that allows uh, usually um, very preferential tax treatment on horses. Okay. Um, and then we had a question from Jeremy Balin on Twitter. Um, he is with Twin Spires and he wants to know, and this is going to be a tough one, what is the percentage of horses for each group that turn out profitable for the individual investors? And like we've said, you know, like we've said, it, it's hard to make money in this business, no matter who you are. You could even have been Shea Kamda and he, you know, spends a lot of money. You got to spend money to make money, it seems, anymore. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to really put that number out there. But for you guys, do you know that percentage? Do you know kind of how you guys have ended up so far in with your partnerships? Well, I follow Jeremy on Twitter. So uh, he's always has some great Twitter posts. So Jeremy, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and obviously there's lots of horse owners and partnerships that would be thrilled to have, uh, have that question. Um, it's easy. I mean, to be honest with you, um, a horse costs X amount of money and costs X amount to keep up. Um, you can, you can add it all together and, and, and then you add up its earnings. Um, the majority of horses struggle um, to earn back uh, what, what the, all their costs are. Um, it's just the reality of racing uh, because on top of, you know, potential lack of talent, um, there's injuries and there's other things that come up. Um, uh, that being said, um, it's like any business that has risk, uh, risk tolerance. Um, there's a lot of guys, I still remember the story where Bill Gates went in to uh, sell the, uh, the mouse to IBM and they laughed him out of the room. Um, people take chances on things and some people are rewarded obviously handsomely. Uh, you know, a Bucero is a horse we paid 43,000 for and he made a million dollars and uh, there's obviously costs involved, but he's obviously quite profitable horse. I think the ultimate thing like any small business is to monitor costs um, and try to be as efficient as um, but as far as I uh, like Jeremy, it's actually interesting. I want to because Jeremy, it, 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 both a, a journalist, it's, it's an interesting question. That's probably a much more broad question to the industry as a whole on the overall sustainability of horse ownership, um, for regular people with the purse structures and the distribution of the purses. But I think the, the great thing about owning horses is they really can come from anywhere. Um, you know, I, uh, I was very familiar with a horse down in Florida named Imperial Hint, who I think anybody who, you know, tried to sell as a potential partner, uh, I think Mike and Nate and I would struggle trying to get people and that horse was one of the great horses over the past 10 years, maybe two or three, or maybe $3 million. Um, so they can come from anywhere. Um, and I think going back to that, um, uh, and what Nate said, I think using the term and, and you used it, Megan, I think using the term investor, I think it's not fantastic that uh, my racehorses continues to use that term. And I don't think really anybody should use the term as, as an investor. Um, if I buy a horse, I own the horse, right? So I don't call myself an investor. I bought them. That's what I do. If I, if I buy season tickets to the Colts and they make the Super Bowl, I, I didn't invest in Colts season tickets. And if they happen to make the Super Bowl and I can sell those tickets for $15,000 each, well, I made a profit. Um, so I think horse ownership, people should look at it as they own the horse um, and it should be managed in that way. And they should be getting multiple streams of both financial potential benefit and personal enjoyment. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if Jeremy, I'd love, I always tell people, and I think it's a great, it's a great question, but you can't get the metric of personal joy you get from owning it and factor that in. Um, so the long story short, I'll answer it honestly, it is difficult to make money in horse racing. Uh, it has to be something you're passionate about and you love doing. Um, but I will say uh, it's, it's, it's out there. The brass ring is out there. And I think that's why most of us do it. Right. And I will say, Jeremy used the word investor. I did not. I'm just yes. reading his questions. Um, we did just have a question pop up. Thank you, Peter. We will get to that in just a moment, but I kind of want to stick with the theme right now. And uh, another question we had from before the seminar started, 
And this will, again, probably will be a, one for Harlan and one for Mike as well on the broodmare side. If you have a partnership on a horse and the horse retires to become either a stallion or a broodmare, does the partnership still have an option to stay in on the horse? Do they still own part of the broodmare and are considered breeders of that mare's foals? And I say this because Harlan in Iron Horse Racing had retired Bucaro. Bucaro is now standing his third season at, um, down in Florida. And Mike has retired some of his mares to become brood mares now. Um, so I'm going to, you know, not to, not to not include Nate on this one, but for you guys, uh, Mike, first, for you, how does that work with you have a partnership in on a broodmare? Let's say, I, I don't recall if Flurry had a partnership, but I do know that she just became a first time mama this year, um, falling out at Springcliff Farm. Um, so how does that work for you when the horse retires and is going to be a broodmare or a breeding stock? Well, that's only happened a few times where, where we have retained them for broodmares. And, and we asked the partners what they want to do if they want to get out and move on to another horse uh, for a racing purpose. And then that's what most of them usually do because they don't want the long-term commitment for, um, for as a broodmare because that that's a long, much longer, longer-term commitment. Um, we have uh, a stallion. We, we, we've never been that lucky to have a stallion to stand, which is a... a great problem to have um so we let them and and we've started to do more colts in these partnerships and fillies um and there is a couple that we retain ourselves each year that we like uh, flurry because we knew her, or we had her mother and and uh, and we just most of the stuff we offer to partnership or stuff that we want to run and we'll run and then be claimed or sold and move on uh, and it's worked out that way. It's worked. Everybody seems to like that. Okay. I, I would say, you? I would say it's the same, uh, same on this end. I mean, I think the way any of these partnerships are structured, it just makes the most sense to set it up in a way where it's a racing partnership. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a mayor that has the uh, potential to be a quality brood mayor uh, and is, is something that of, of some value to somebody, um, I think, uh, and, in, and even in the case of a stallion, um, uh, to put it through public auction uh, makes the most sense, uh, which gives pretty much all the partners the availability if they did want to stay in um, to, to purchase, you know, they already would own whatever percentage of, uh, to put a public price, a public market value on, on that, on that uh, horse. So uh, we haven't had it yet. We actually, actually we did have, it. we had one of our brood mares who we put into an auction um, and it was sold and the money was distributed. Uh, obviously, if we had a group, um, you know, one of the nice things about groups like this that are a little bit smaller is, look, if there is a consensus that the entire group wants to keep the horse, um, you know, we would manage that without a problem. We manage a stallion right now. Um, and uh, we have a, a decent sized broodmare uh, band for Bucaro. Um, so we do that. But I think everybody coming in should expect unless it's disclosed, these are racing partnerships. Uh, and at the end of the racing career, uh, we're gonna make the financial uh, a move to um, uh, get it sold in some way to return that uh, to, to partners um, and go from there. Definitely. Um, how is an emergency situation handled with horses in a partnership? What kind of aid arrangement is in place for decisions? Is a single partner or the managing partner, are they the ones that are the go-to for the decisions or is it contacting all the partners for consent? And, you know, and with this, if anybody knows horses, they know if, you know, that if they can get into something, they can. And even if you don't think they can, they will figure out a way to hurt themselves, whether it's, you know, a slit eyelid, um, you know, you know, having lameness issues. So it's going to happen. And that's really important for potential 
owners to understand that that's going to happen. Horses, it's very rare to have a horse, you know, stay sound and healthy from birth to, you know, all the way to death. It's, I mean, I have quarter horses and it's really difficult for them to do that. And they just, you know, live on the farm. So um, how do you guys handle if there are vet situations, emergency situations, and um, with your groups. And I'll go to Nate first. Nate, how do you guys handle it over at B&B? Um, in our contract, it's always stated um, it's the horse first. Any decision medically is made in the best interest of the horse. And then uh, we usually rely on the, the trainer's um, advice on what to do. And if it comes back to us it's it's usually just the managing partner that makes the decision for the group but we really rely on the uh, judgment of the trainer okay mike how do you guys handle it well, especially with you as the trainer as the well trainer, there's a difference right we uh we let all the partners know what the what's happening uh what the veterinarians say and what we think will happen down the road to this to the horse whether it be good bad or or it might be a long-term rest or something like that so we 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 let them know we let them know what the vets say and uh, uh go from there and make the decision harlan do you have anything to add yeah i mean i, th I again i think this just goes back to uh partners viewing themselves as basically a small a small owner um i tell people you have to look at it if you own the whole horse um, so we have a managing partner, which is me, uh, which I think obviously that's why they come to a partnership to, to sieve through all the data and make a decision. It's the best interest of both the partners and the horse. Um, and obviously the horse's interest being the priority. Um, so at the end of the day, if something does come along, uh, I look to the trainer, the veterinarians to make a, a decision on what, what needs to be done. Um, but the partners really need to understand um you know this they own this is this is like getting a puppy um you know you don't just you know when the horse when the puppy's five years old say well that's i'm done with that you know i really try to impress upon people you're in this thing you know this is your horse he depends on you she depends on you if she gets sick we got to take care of her um obviously there are situations where uh you know the vet might look and say and this happens financially this doesn't make sense to you know to do this um, and, and they'll make that recommendation. But generally, I look to the partners in, uh, to take on the responsibility that, you know, we've taken responsibility of this animal and what's right by it. But we'll obviously always take into a broader consideration of what makes sense for the animal, um, you know, long term as far as racing. Exactly. And it's always about the horse. You know, that's the most important thing when it comes to um, the people of, of the horse racing industry is the horse comes number one. Uh, Peter Stanley asked us a question. He said, when selecting a yearling or breeding yourself, how do you go about assessing the stallion mare suitability match? Do you use a system? Do you use a program such as True Nix or G1 Goldmine? Um, I know just side, side note, um, Mr. Robert Keck with Crestwood, he had a great seminar with us back in December. It was a four and a half hour long seminar, but it was so informative about how important it was to research deeper than just the four or five generations that some of the other, some of the online um, nicking websites have. So it's always kind of important, I think, to look there. But how do you guys, when you're selecting a, a yearling or if you're selecting a breeding and um, Harlan and I will ask you to, you know, not just Bucaro, but in other ways, how do you guys, how do you guys choose the best fit for what you are wanting for your groups? I'll let somebody go first since I've been limited from just speaking about Bucaro. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, uh, when I partnered with uh, TC Racing and uh, Jim Doby on the, the mayor this year, we, we visited probably four or five stallion farms, looked at the stallions, we went home, did the nicking, and then just looked at their race record and 
what distances they ran, what surfaces they ran. And uh, then we ended up with the Nawi. And then, uh, which I think he was an A Nick. So, you know, the nicking played a little bit into that, but really just compared the, the, the mare and the stallion and wanted something that was pretty well close. And then with uh, Royal Jim this year, um, there, she nicked well with everybody. So the nicking was thrown out the window and we just started looking. Uh, she had one on turf, she had one on dirt, and then you know, calculator, he won on uh, three surfaces and Indiana sired. So we, we went that direction. Um, since, since I have the mares mostly, I um, see a lot of the horses run, on, run at the track during, during their careers. And I like them or, or, or dislike them. I see them when they go to the stud. I have to uh, cost how much they they um, how much they're standing for, and the mare whether I know a lot of the traits of the mare, and I just um, I I do use nicking. It's it's not the gospel. It's a guide, um, and I use what what I feel is is best for the mare in the pocketbook, and uh, and then we're racing. And, and, we, and we pretty much stay in the area just because of the cost of, of going to other area parts of the country. Plus there's plenty of plenty of stallions in, um, in, in a short radius. And we do have a Reddy's image. We have stood in Indiana for the last few years with Calumet Farm and that's worked out. And I bring most of the Indiana sire to him. Uh, which I think he's a very good sire, being my more than ready. He's a very good state sire for a state program. So yes, we just <laughs> we just kind of fish like anybody else. We, we kind of look for traits or or different little things, and and then you go and hope it all works out. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it it, it doesn't. So. Okay, Harlan, if you have something to add to that, you can. Uh, I'll make it short. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm a big believer to know what you're good at and what you you know what you need information uh, where to get other information from people. And I think there are a lot of people I work with in the industry, and it, it's such a great industry as far as um, the depth of talent and knowledge. Um, so we work with bloodstock agents, farms, farms that have mares. Uh, we've used obviously True Nicks and and Enix and uh, Goldmine, they're all very, very interesting tools. And they're, they're statistically based, obviously. So there is, there is clearly some um, real data to back it up. Um, but uh, it is always very interesting because um, we work with a lot of farms with a lot of very good horse men and women. And often I'll see something on paper based on statistics. And then when I speak to the farm, uh, a lot of their ideals will be very similar and a lot of it will just be based on eyeballing, you know, the type of mare, the type of stallion, how they're going to fit together, what they've seen in the past. Um, so there's just a lot of parts uh, to it. And I think really uh, horse racing and, you know, Mike is just obviously a, you know, he knows more in his, his right pinky than I do about horses, um, you know, for all these years, you know, I think you take all that information and you go to people um, who are experts in that uh, and, and seek it out. Um, but Megan disabled my ability to share my screen and I was going to share Bucaro. So <laughs> you can all thank Megan for not having to look at a picture of Bucaro right now. I do have to say he is very pretty and I am probably, <laughs> well, my daughter would say that she's his number one fan. I'll have to be. There we go. Too. Um, so yes. Uh, so we have another question from our attendees. For Mr. Moulter and Mr. Brannon, do your trainers ever own a percentage of the horse within the partnership in exchange for reduced training fees? Um, our trainer has always owned a, a percentage of the horse, but not for a reduced uh, training fee, no. And again, obviously this is a, we have a broad panel, we have a trainer on the panel. So I have a specific opinion on that and that does not make my opinion correct. 
I'm just a very big person on conflict of interest. Um, and I, the conflict of interest, I, I have a legal background and it's, it's just, you want to kind of keep every conflict of interest that possible. Um, so uh, I don't think there's absolutely anything wrong with the trainer owning a percentage of the horse at all. Um, but I think that just by eliminating that and having the partners own the entire horse, uh, so all the decisions come from the partners, uh, just eliminates that. That doesn't mean that's the right or wrong way to do it. Um, I'm sure if I had a horse that, that Mike owned a part of, we would work together as a team and do that. Um, or if I had a trainer like that, but I just, uh, for Iron Horse, we don't have the trainers owning uh, any part of it. And we gen we don't uh, participate in any sort of um, uh, kind of deals where the, the trainer gets a percentage of, uh, of the horse's earnings for a discounted training rate. Again, solely for a conflict of interest uh, reason, but uh, not to say on any specific um, arrangement that wouldn't work totally fine. We just don't do it. Okay. Um, how does a partner exit the partnership? How can somebody, if they want out for some reason or another, what is, what do you guys kind of go through with that partner to exit the real exit the relationship and we'll just say for um for ease of explanation that the horse is still actively racing um, i'll i'll start with it uh horses are kind of uh there obviously is about illiquid of a marketplace um as there is out there to be able to you know find someone to fill your spot so i try to tell people right from the start you're buying a horse the horse is going to have a long career, short career, and then you'll be out. Um, obviously, uh, they somewhat self-fulfill, meaning if the horse is very good and you want out, well, it's not going to be very hard to find someone to buy. And if the horse is not very good, probably no one's going to buy from you at that time. So um, you really have to go on the assumption that uh, you are in that horse until the end. Um, what I have suggested to people, if they do want to get out of it, um, they're going to have to make a very good deal for the buyer, plain and simple. Uh, some people obviously do run in situations where they don't want to be part of it and everyone runs into their own financial situations. Um, but we advocate, this is not going to be a liquid marketplace. You're not going to be able to, you know, just sell out when you want to sell out. Um, but if, if, if we have, we've had maybe one or two people, I've just said, look, it's going to have to be a really good deal for the buyer. Um, because, you know, this isn't a marketplace that most people are looking to buy into an existing partnership. Just like, again, I try to explain to everybody, pretend you own the whole horse. Um, you know, if you own the whole horse and you didn't want to own it anymore, what would you do? Um, you probably would have to, you know, sell it for a very uh, attractive price to the buyer. Um, so that, that's basically what I, what we try to tell our partners. Yes, we, we, we do this very similar, except we do have where any partner within the horse has first right of matching the, the, if there is a sale price. Um, just because they have the opportunity to stay in at a bigger piece. And, um, but as it's, a, it's not a long term, it's not a 10 year investment usually, it's a, it's a one to three year um, deal with each horse usually. Yeah, we're kind of the same way. Um, this is why um, I now do um, six months in advance instead of instead of month to month, because uh, um, it's it. If your horse is doing well, everybody wants to be a part of it, and then if if your horse is not performing, and then somebody wants out, it's hard to find somebody to. Uh, take that spot or purchase the purchase the uh the percentage that somebody wants out and it's always uh somebody that's in the group has a first option uh to buy that percentage of the person that wants out but um i just tell them they're responsible until we can find a uh a new owner but um this with the six month thing it, it gives us a little cushion there to uh to, to, to find an, an, an uh, owner that wants in our group. Okay. And um, Michael Klingler, I see you have your hand up. So go ahead and type in your question or your comment 
in the chat over on our Facebook Live. We have a question. Well, first of all, uh, Bree Miner would like to know, Mr. Lauer, how is Sparrow doing? Uh, Sparrow's doing fine. Uh, hopefully he will run the next month at, at Indiana. Uh, he's at Indiana Grand now. He's breathed a couple of times. And uh, as I said, hopefully he will be within the next uh, 30 days running. And hopefully for a very good season. <laughs> And then uh, Tony Medley asks on Facebook Live, he says, to Harlan and Nate, do you guys pull partners when decisions need to be made? Example, what horse to get in on, naming a horse, where to race, and that sort of thing. And I can say from experience, I do know that there is um, some a sense of teamwork involved in naming, at least naming of the horse within Iron Horse. Yeah, I'll, since we talked about that, um, we generally uh, naming the horse is a poll. Um, I will say that I've, I have to modify the rules because I have everybody propose names and then they all vote for their name. So I get a lot of ones. Um, so I might uh, that, that does happen, but we have a lot of fun with the naming and people come up with really great things. Uh, as far as the rest of the decisions, um, I think the majority of people come into something like Iron Horse because um, they're in a group, they understand it's a group, and they hopefully have um, researched Iron Horse and myself and my experience and, uh, and the way I utilize the trainers that we use and the decisions we make. Um, we don't poll um, on race placement or what horse we're going to buy. Uh, that's why they're coming to Iron Horse. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it, I think from the start, it makes much more sense um, and enjoyment um, if everyone just says, well, listen, this is who the, the, the person is that's going to be making decisions and we're all in this together and that's why we're here. And I don't have to worry about um, uh, arguing or differing opinions, um, you know, getting into um uh, the, the, getting into it. I mean, uh, the, the way I'd almost like to say is it would be similar to, you know, when, when there's a big trade made by a professional sports team, if, you, you know, if all of the season ticket holders got a say in it, uh, they probably would never get a trade done. I think everyone just has to have faith. And, you know, sometimes people don't love a decision, um, but I think everyone understands both I'm sure for Mike and for Nate, we're doing what's in the best interest for the group as a whole. Um, and I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Mike. No, that's fine. Nate. Go, go, go right ahead. Um, on our, on ours, we uh, we get the group together, and then our our first couple of horses, we went and looked at the horses, and and everybody was in agreement that uh, they wanted to be a part of that horse, and uh, we went from there. But on, on the most recent one. Uh, I kind of was, wasn't really looking for partners. It was just something I was going to tinker around with. And then next thing I know, my phone was ringing and we've got six partners on this horse. But it, so each, each time we've had the horse beforehand. So it wasn't like we went out to, uh, to select or look at a sale or anything. We, uh, Anthony gave us options and we went and looked at horses that he had available. And the, the group decided that, yeah, we want to be a part of, of, of that horse. And as far as naming, uh, we've already, on our first full, we've already had about 40 names thrown out. So we're, <laughs> we're a long way from naming this full. This full. Definitely. But it'll be, a, it'll be a, vote, a vote thing. And like Harlan said, it's, you're going to have to give out a, a, couple, a couple numbers because everybody would vote for their own name. Yeah. <laughs> It, it can be na naming horses man that's one of the fun parts of owning a horse i mean it, it's a lot of fun you could be like my daughter and have a black pony named grew after minions um <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really good question um and i know harlan has some experience with this and I think it's actually something that really does need to be addressed nationally. But Ray Schroeder asks, in these partnerships, can a buyer get an Indiana racing license? 
And I do know um, from past that I believe the limit is like 4.9% or lower does not get a license. Is that correct, Harlan? Uh, I, every state has a little bit different way of dealing with it. But I, the short answer is if somebody wants to get a license, they get a license and we can get them a license. So even if they have a smaller percent, in most places we can, we can make it happen. Um, and uh, it just kind of goes to the, the, the individual horse and the jurisdiction it's running in. Yeah, I think Indiana is, is 5% and uh, all of our partners have owned 5 or 10%. So yeah, they get a license. Yeah. We leave, it, it, oh, we leave it up to them because license, as you will find out, is one of the pains of racing. Uh, when you go state to state to state and you will be overnighting packages to, to Arkansas in a, in a drastic, oh, I thought we, I wouldn't have to get licensed in that state. So um, we leave it up to the person. Now, since most racetracks are free to get in now, it's not, it's not like a pass to get in like it was in the old, in older days or past days. Uh, some tracks it still is. But um, it um, um, it can be a, it can be stressful if, if everybody has to get a license, uh, right? For, and for just them, for us, because it's a, it's it's it can be a pain to put it in a simple term. And just to note that in Indiana, that um, a lot that in order to get into the paddock, you have to have a license, you have to show it. So if you want to get in the selling paddock, and that's not just for anybody, you kind of have to be on your toes there and, um, and all. And then a lot of times for the backside, for some jurisdictions, you have to have a license and some some you don't, it just depends. Um, and a lot of times if you want to go on the backside, say to do the treats and pictures um, on in a non-pandemic season, um, last year, unfortunately, Indiana Grand, you weren't allowed to, but a lot of times the groups can go as long as they are chaperoned by the trainer or the license holder and you're able to go that route so it just always depends and it's really important to make sure that you talk with your managing partner about the license licensures and the different um the different jurisdictions so um um i have i i, I laughed a little at this question because i already know the answer but i want to be fair and ask everybody's question Chances of Bucaro coming back to Indiana to stand at stud. Boom. <laughs> did, Nate answer, did Nate ask that question? Um, uh, well, right now, there's no plans for Bucaro to leave Florida. He's obviously, um, I think we've we bred to 291 mares the first two years down in Florida. So the breeders are very happy with him down there. His babies are doing great. They just went through the sale. Um, in January and sold quite well. And, uh, uh, you know, Bucero will always uh, have Indiana in his heart. Um, and I think always represent Indiana. Uh, but for the, at this point, he's, uh, he's, he's very much enjoying uh, Florida. Um, but um, time, will, time will tell. But right now, uh, there's no plans for him to leave Florida. Definitely. Yes. And somebody, James Jones said, finally, someone asked the big question. <laughs> but everybody in Indiana is welcome to come down and visit him. He loves peppermints. He's a very friendly horse. And, and if they like to bring their mares with them, that would be even better. So anybody who would like to visit him with their mares, uh, he'd like that probably the best. No, I really feel, excuse me, he's done a very good job with Bruchero, taking him to Florida, where it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, he fits that market perfectly, the horse does. Uh, where in Kentucky, he, 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 he might have got lost um, because of the number of stallions, but uh, I, I, I commend him for standing. And Mary's done a great job, obviously, by getting that many mares. I appreciate it, Mike. And he does, he does often tell me he'd like to visit his dad in Kentucky eventually, but uh, I told him he needs to make some runners first. So we'll go from there. <laughs> How do you set up your LLC? We had a, the question came from Eric 
are all the partners listed on the LLC or do partners just buy shares that the LLC sells? Yeah. In my group, all the partners are listed on the LLC and we have our accountant uh, apply with the state and get those LLCs. Harlan, how about you guys? Yeah, all of, all of our partners, similar situation, all of our partners will end up getting, you know, uh, will, will be a member um, and, and get a K-1 at the end of the year uh, on an individual basis. Okay. Um, on... Um, well, we don't have an LLC, except, and uh, we just send them a bill and a statement at the end of the year, and, and uh, it's up to them and their taxes. Okay. And I had another question specifically uh, Megan. for... Harlan. Um, for Harlan. <laughs> oh, there she is. Sorry. <laughs> you just, you froze. I know. Um, and one more, another question for Mike, and that is how is Dreaming Big and who is she in full to? Dreaming Big is doing quite well. Uh, if it was daylight, I could see her, but it's not. So um, she's in photo looking at Lucky. And she's been on like a four-year, five-year cycle where she falls in late May or early June. And I keep saying, we just breed her once and if it don't work, we, we give her the year off. Well, she gets in fall every time. So it's, it's uh, but she has, she's in fall looking at Lucky and do May 25th to May to June 1st. And that's the way it's, she folded the last three, four years I think in that, in that period. And it's worked so. Okay, and we have a question from Chuck Haynes on Facebook. He asks, "How do you value homebreds for a group?" And of course, this would be a big one for Mike, um, since that's primarily what you race. Um, so, how do you value the homebreds for a group situation? Well, we go by the yearling averages, and. Uh, that that's one guide and and then we go by the individual to the horse itself and uh we um the yearling average starts is the start of it and we, we have people come out and look at them and um uh, uh, we set a price and if they like it they, they do and if they don't they might buy another one we've had horses where they liked it but we didn't like the horse and told him we, we don't like the horse and, and we advise you to go to another horse and then we might race the horse ourselves but uh no the yearling sales is a, is a major uh, uh is a major guideline yearling averages okay uh we had someone ask can someone from australia buy a share in your horses or are there restrictions uh, I'll answer that one only because actually two things. One, I actually spent uh, a little bit of time yesterday reading uh, Australia's a very, very good uh, advertising campaign to get foreign investors into Australia. Um, and I would actually, if anyone in Australia is listening, I would love to stand Bucaro for a Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I think he fit Australia fantastic. That's in the cards. But anyway, getting back to, uh, we, we actually have two partners uh, from the UK um, it's a little bit of hoops um, to get a tax ID number, um, but we've gone through that process uh, for them. Um, so there would not be a problem. Uh, there'd just be a little bit of a process. They'd probably want to talk to their accountant um, in Australia. We would love to have an Australian partner. So um, I think it'd be a ton of fun. And I actually have thought down the road, uh, we have thought of, of sending a Bucaro baby over to the UK to campaign. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to go uh, Southern Hemisphere um, to change over, but um, we'd love to also potentially have an Iron Horse horse in Australia down the road. Very good. And a very important question. I have just a couple questions left and then we'll wrap things up. Um, but this is a really important question for the three of you. Are do you have any horses available now for partnership rate partnerships racing in Indiana? And I think I know the answer to that. And all three of you are going to say yes. So why don't you guys kind of, if you already have horses that you have in mind, 
feel free. I'm going to, I'll let you guys have a little bit of time to do your own little um, advertising. Um, but we'll do that at the end because I do have another really important question. So Ray Schroeder, I want to let you know that I did get your question and we will get to it. Um, but uh, one last question from Paul Devine. And I think this is really important um, because, you know, I, I feel like group ownership is kind of the, the future of horse racing. It's one of the biggest ways that we're going to be able to keep this sport alive um, and all is to try to get more people involved in that way. Um, for Paul asks, for those looking to start their own partnerships, what would you suggest doing first? Setting up your team of bloodstock agents, trainers, etc., or finding partners to help determine what financial level you will participate in? I would say get your group together and uh, see what financial uh, uh, restrictions you're going to have and, th and then go forward from there. Yeah, see if the group wants one horse to, you know, the group has to be in agreement on how many horses and how much money. Uh, my, my first advice would be to, if, if you don't have experience being a partner or having owned a horse prior, I would not buy a horse on your own and start a partnership. Uh, I, I would I would join a group, uh, kind of learn the ins and outs. Um, uh, I am a terrible skier, and I tried snowboarding one time. And the first three days of snowboarding, I decided I was just going to kill myself if I continued to do it, so I quit. But eventually, apparently, if you if you do it for a week or two, you do well. Uh, horse racing is is equally unforgiving um, if, if you don't know what you're doing. And I really think that um, the first thing I would do is get involved, start to learn the ins and outs of what's happening on the on, on all the parts of it, um, and, and then go to start. And then once you do decide to start, um, I think having already been part of uh, a group, you will have probably met people, know the right questions to ask. Um, so I think that answer to, to that is, you're going to answer that once you've kind of learned the ins and out. And I think partnerships the best way to get to that point. Definitely. And so now is the big question. Um, and if you guys want to, this is your chance to kind of promote yourselves a little bit more. Um, I thank you. I thank everybody for attending. I think this was a great success and we have recorded it to keep um, and we will put it on the Indiana Thoroughbred Alliance's YouTube channel as well as their um, website at, so at a later date. Um, and um, Joni Patterson says, thank you so much. I love group ownerships. I have been part of Grand Gesture, bought into AJ Pacer, joined my racehorse and won the Derby. And now I am part of BNB and look forward to 2021. So congratulations, Indiana. Um, owner of a Kentucky Derby winner. So let's talk, you guys. What horses do you guys have available and what partnerships are you looking at to run at Indiana Grand? Um, I, my group right now, uh, currently, uh, we're full up right now with the horses that we have, but what we'll do is get our group together and then we'll approach Tony or Tiana and see what's what's available for our new group. Um, and we make sure we get our groups first and, and then go forward from there. Okay, Mike, I know you've got a bunch of two-year-olds. Right, we, we have a, a group of two-year-olds and, and about half of them is Indiana sired and about a third of them is Indiana bred and then the other third is um, sixth is Kentucky bread um, and, and, and they're all available. Um, ours is like in training and already at the track almost all of ours uh, before we partner up with them. So people can get in and they don't have to know each other to, to get in. They don't have to be a group. They can be strangers and sometimes they make great friends at it. Uh, and sometimes it's groups together that 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 will, will come in and uh, go from there. 
But no, we have a, a, a group of sired horses, our best, our largest group of sire, Indiana sired horses we've ever had. So ho hopefully that all works out and everybody's invited. And, and, Harlan, and, 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 and we do claiming, we do, sorry about that. We do some, some people want, want to get in, they don't want to wait, they want to claim something immediately. We, we do that, uh, we have a formal partnership with that if, it, if uh, we have a group that wants to do that, which is instant, instant racing almost, because you can claim and within a month, hopefully run back. Definitely. Harlan, how about you? We we have, um, as I mentioned, we buy most of our most of all of our horses at public auction. Um, so the April sale at uh, OBS and Ocala is coming up. Uh, we already have a couple partnerships lined up with multiple trainers. Uh, uh, the Indiana one will be at, will be with Tim Gleishaw, who will be based at uh, at Churchill and in Indiana Grand. Um, he's always been a uh, top trainer in Indiana and in Kentucky. He's done very very well. So. What we'll end up doing is what we try to do is put the partnership together prior, meaning people who want to be involved uh, will reach out and say, hey, I'd like to be part of this. Um, we go out and look for the horse for the group. Um, if there's some shares left after we purchase it, we'll publish it on our website or send out to our mailing list that there's some shares available. Um, but we're going to have one with Bill Mott, uh, Christophe Clement, um, and Tim Gleisha. And the Tim horse will be, uh, as I said, in Indiana or Kentucky. Um, what we try to do is buy the best available horse. Um, for Tim, we generally look for an Indiana bred if, if available. Um, but a lot of the Indiana breds don't end up in the two-year-old sales. Uh, and we kind of don't force the issue. Uh, but we will buy a horse that will fit uh, the Kentucky Indiana program. And uh, most of the horses we bought for Tim uh, that have run both in Kentucky and Indiana. So it uh, gives our partners the ability to get down to Churchill, Keeneland uh, to see some races um, and also run at Indiana. So that's on our website and people can go. The best way to do is go to the website and uh, sign up for uh, our newsletter so they will get that or just reach out to me directly on the website and I can get them updated. Definitely. And I, I do want to share um, that... The Indian Thoroughbred Alliance has started a group, a page on their website. If you go to indianatv.org and then you look at about, and then it'll say Indiana ownership groups. And we have listed, we have the, your guys is three BNB stables, Iron Horse and Michael Lauer Racing Stable, as well as Aaron West's West Thoroughbreds. And there is a link. So if you guys, for those of you that are a part of um, tonight's webinar and you're interested, you've got your information here, you have an instant link to their website, we can share contact information if you guys are interested in getting in touch with either of these three gentlemen. And, um, and yeah, we can, we'll definitely, we're excited to bring more people along. Um, it's important to say that it, one good thing, and I might be a little biased, but you know, racing in Indiana and being part of a group in Indiana, you have so, so many different opportunities for you. The, um, especially if you are racing in Indiana bred or if you're racing in Indi Indiana sired horse, there's even more. So it's very profitable to be able to have a horse to race at Indiana Grand in Shelbyville. And they're racing again. Um, they open April 13th. Am I right, Mike? Am I right? 12th. I think it's the 12th. Okay. And they race until, um, I believe this year, they're going to late November this year. So, you know, there's great opportunities. It's a family friendly track. Um, I take my daughter and turn her loose on the apron and she plays in the, in the playground and, you know, and watches the horses and, and everything. So it's definitely a lot of fun. So I hope if you are in the area, you're able to make it out to Indiana Grand, or if you're interested in something a little different, uh, Hoosier Park has the harness racing and that's their racing now. So you guys can check that out as well. Um, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Harlan, Mike, and Nate. I appreciate your guys' time. Um, you know, I know it's a busy season but I really hope that this has helped everybody and um, kind of learning a little bit more. If you have any other questions, feel free 
to reach out to the ITA and we will do our best to get them answered. We'll do our best to uh, direct you in the right path when it comes to joining an ownership group. Um, at the end of this webinar, we do have some questions that, for, that we would love for our attendees to answer. Um, and so if you, you will get those in an email and you will also get this at the end of the webinar. And we would just like to learn a little bit more about who attended and if you are interested in any information about any of the three groups here or even West Thoroughbreds, or if you have a ownership group and you are working, looking for new members, then you can you know, let us know and we will sign you on to the list as well. So thank you guys very much. Any final words from the three of you? No, thank, thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure in the support of Indiana Racing, which I think is a, is a, is a very great state to race in because um, it's, an up, it's, it's on the up, upswing. Absolutely. Thank you, Megan. It's been, uh, it's been great being part of it. Yeah, uh, appreciate it, Megan. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is uh, if anybody is considering getting in on a fractional ownership team, I encourage you to do it, whether it's with me, Harlan, Mike, or anyone else. You know, five years ago, I didn't know how I never even heard of fractional ownership. I didn't know how to get in. It's just one little conversation with uh, Tiana got me involved. Now I've been on six horses. We've had lots of fun. There, there is nothing like the thrill of heading to that winter circle, uh, standing at the paddock, watching your horse parade. And these fractional ownerships uh, are, in my opinion, the way to go. And you know, even though I, right now we're just, um, uh, b, b is just Indiana racing. You know, I've talked, uh, chatted, uh, back and forth messenger with Harlan, uh, about a month ago that, you know, maybe we'll do something down the road. And I've shared that with my group that, Hey, you know, if we ever want to get outside of, uh, you know, maybe we can partner with, with iron horse and, go for something big, you know, so it's, it's on the back. Burner. Love to have, would love to have you, Nate. But uh, it's, on, it's on the, it's on the agenda in the future, but right now we're, we're strictly Indiana and uh, we're having fun. And I encourage anybody to uh, get in a, on a fractional ownership team because it, it's been a blast. Definitely. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time. Um, as my daughter is showing, it is now bedtime for her. Um, but thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you to everybody that attended and sent in any questions, especially Jeremy. I'll make sure that he knows that Harlan answered his question. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any questions, please go to indianatv.org. And thank you guys so much. Have a great evening and best of luck at the track. We'll see you in the winter circle. All right, appreciate it. See you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.